Hey guys, welcome back to Chariot Palmistry. My name is Dr. Sulab Jain, and this is the first video in a series that I'm calling the most important video series that I will ever make. And if I do my job right in this video series, I'll be able to give you guys a context on what's going on in the world around you and actually be able to set you guys up and your families for the next few generations and also centuries to come. We're going to be covering a lot of advanced concepts and ideas from history, philosophy, spirituality, economics, and much, much more. And there's a lot of information in this series, which is why I've put it all in a PowerPoint presentation. Because everyone knows the most important information is in PowerPoint format, right? So again, if I do my job right, then this will help you understand everything that's going to happen to you in the coming years. Now, I've decided to deliberately simplify this video so that we're not going over a lot of information that goes over your head. I'm going to try and make this as easy and simple to understand as I possibly can. But there's one concept that I would like to start by introducing to you guys. That's an Indian concept known as the Yuga. A yoga is a word that translates basically into an era, like an era of time or an age of time. And according to the ancient Indians, humanity goes through cycles of time and each era is called a yoga. They believe there are four primary eras. There's the era of truth and purity. Then that descends into an age known as uh, Sorry, it starts with Satyug, and then it goes to Treta Yug, which is the age of like the sun or the age of, uh, how would you say, more go governance, I think. That descends into another age called Dwapar Yug, which is ruled by the energy of Mercury, and that's more about money and making commerce and finance. After that, that descends into another age called Kal Yug. And that's ruled by the energy of Saturn, and Kalyug basically is the era of darkness and the era of ignorance. According to the Indians, we are currently in the Kalyug right now. But the point I'm trying to make is that each era has its own characteristics and its own sets of behavior. When one era ends, there's destruction on all levels of society, and then a new era begins. Now, the big insight I suppose I want you guys to have is that we currently live in a time where one yoga is ending and another is beginning. This is something that's very different to mainstream Hindu thought. According to the mainstream Hindus, they'll tell you that this current era that we're in, the Kalyug, the era of darkness, will go on for many, many thousands of years. I don't know if that's necessarily correct and maybe part of this presentation is to give you guys the insight on why that is. So it's what I'm saying isn't a traditional mainstream Hindu thought but I'll keep referencing it on occasion because it will give you guys some context. Now the main context here is we've gone through or humanity has gone through about nine different ages or nine different yugas already. And again, history of humanity is defined by the age in which we live in. So the first age of humanity was the Paleolithic, or the Early Stone Age. At the end of that age, all of society was destroyed, and then along came the Ice Age. Followed by that was the Mesolithic, which was the era of hunter-gatherers. And then came the Neolithic, which was the era of agriculture. Between each era, society completely destroyed itself, and then we had to rebuild. <clears throat> At the end of the Neolithic came the Bronze Age, which was actually one of the golden periods of humanity. That's the period where we invented writing, we built civilization as we know it today, in addition to building like the Great Pyramids, the Great Wall of China, and things like that. At the end of the Bronze Age, society completely collapsed in a period known as the Bronze Age Collapse, and the Iron Age was born. Then the Iron Age collapsed after a few thousand years, and then the Dark Ages began. Then that period collapsed, and the Industrial Age began. And my thesis is, right now, the Industrial Age is collapsing, and the Information Age is starting up. 
this is, as I said, the big insight here. If you believe that we're living in the information age and that previously we were in the industrial age, you'll see that one yuga is actually ending right in front of our eyes. So to understand or to really explain this, let me go back to the year 1995. That's the period of time where the internet went mainstream. I remember living in New Jersey at that point in time, and back then there was a company called America Online that used to send out these little CD-ROMs to everyone's house to get them to connect to the internet. That's when my family first connected to the internet in 1995. That's a period of time where the information age began. And it's almost 30 years ago, but what you'll notice is slowly and steadily since then, the industrial age has actually been declining and the information age has been taking over. Now that decline of the industrial age actually means the destruction of all social, political and economic structures that depended upon the industrial age. Remember the industrial age had been going on for centuries and all of our society had been built on that premise. Now that it's, it itself is being destroyed, it means every aspect of society built upon the industrial age will need to be destroyed as well. But it's not just wanton destruction here, there's actually a rebirth happening too. The industrial age is declining and the information age is slowly taking it over. So if you look at the world around you, you'll notice that all social systems are being destroyed. All politicians and political parties are being destroyed, entire economies are being destroyed, and so is the environment. And actually, so is the family structure. There is huge, unprecedented disruption happening everywhere around you. And they all have one common denominator, which is the internet, the super technology which heralded in the information age. So if there's one key takeaway I want you guys to have out of this video and this series of videos, that is that the industrial age is declining and that it will continue to decline maybe for about another decade or so in order to complete its destruction. As this happens, the information age is taking over and this will cause chaos and destruction everywhere. It's the death of the old and the birth of the new. And what this video series is about is giving you guys the tools on how to navigate this destruction, how to set yourselves up so that your family and your future generations are in the best chance to succeed possible. Now before I go on and explain how best to navigate this whole mess that we're about to go through, I want to address a bias that some of you guys may be questioning here. That is, why is this time different? Doesn't every generation think that they're special and that the world is ending within their lifetimes? If you look at the baby boomer generation, the guys who went through the Cold War, they would have told you that the threat of nuclear war was certainly going to destroy all of humanity. And there was a very real risk at that point. People thought you know, that there'd be nuclear war between the US and the USSR, that the only life that would survive would be the cockroaches. They would have been right to think that. Then the generation before them, the World War II generation, probably thought that the Nazis were going to take over the world and destroy everyone. And the generation before that, the World War I generation, would have thought a similar thing too. So every generation thinks this way, right? Why it's so special about this time? What I want you to have a look at is that each generation was still living within the industrial age. And each act of war, or each war and act of destruction, did not actually create a new era or a new age. One phrase from that period was the atomic age, especially after the bombs fell on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. People thought we'd entered into the atomic age. But atomic energy or nuclear fusion is really just a new way of generating energy. And energy generation is essential for all industrial applications. It's not a new technology like the internet. It's just a means of making something more efficient than what existed before. If you look at the industrial age, you'll see it really unfolded in four steps. Four, by the way, is a magical number that I'll come back to and I'll explain more in detail in just a little while. But the industrial age basically started out with coal power. 
burning coal to generate or to fuel steam engines and locomotives. That was the beginning of the industrial age. Then we started to shift and generate power and energy from oil, then from alternating current electricity, and then from nuclear power. In other words, each of those major wars that we talked about did not create a new era. They were just doing something more efficiently than what happened before. The internet and the information age is a completely different beast here. So that comes then to the question, if we are living in a new age, who will succeed in this age? And let's have a look at these nine ages or eras or yugas that we've gone through. Oh, and by the way, I should mention that according to the Hindus, they believe that there's nine incarnations of the god Vishnu. That at the end of every age, Vishnu incarnates on earth, helps to destroy society, and uh, maintains dharam, or the idea of righteousness. So that the rebirth of society is as peaceful and less traumatic as possible. There is, There has to be some sort of correlation between these nine historical ages and these nine incarnations of Vishnu. But I'm not going to go into that too much in this video series because I don't want to make this sound like something apocalyptic. Because that's really the context in Vishnu's rebirth or reappearance. The, to answer the simple question on who succeeds in each age, let's have a look at the super technologies in that period. In the Paleolithic, the earliest part of the Stone Age, the most powerful weapon in the world at that point in time with stone tools. The species that could pick up a piece of rock and carve it and shape it into like a blade or into a spear tip, that was a species that would dominate the world. That was our earliest hominid ancestors. And they eventually turned into Homo sapiens, uh, Neanderthals, Denisovians, and all the other species, uh, our cousins more or less, on the evolutionary branch. After that came the Ice Age. And in the Ice Age, well firstly between the Stone Age and the Ice Age, a lot of life on the planet died. And the superpower in that, or the super weapon in that age, was fire. The species that could build a fire and stay warm would be the species that survived and thrived in that era. And Neanderthals did this, Homo sapiens did this. I'm pretty sure our other hominid cousins, the Denisovians and other species would have done this as well meaning fire was a super weapon in the Ice Age. Then came the Mesolithic, the era of hunter-gatherers. We started using stones in addition to fire to hunt for animals, and we started living a nomadic existence. And we meaning our ancestors in Africa mostly at that point. After that period came the Neolithic, which was the agricultural age. And the superpower or the super weapon in that era was actually fertile land. We discovered how to grow grains out of the ground itself, as opposed to uh, being nomadic and hunting for food. We would stay stationary in one place and grow food. So the most powerful societies in the world at that point were the ones who had access to the most fertile lands. There were four of them primarily, which was China, ancient India, uh, ancient Samaria, and ancient Egypt. And these four societies eventually went from small villages into small cities into giant cities. And that's what started up the Bronze Age. See, the Bronze Age was the beginning of civilization. But bronze itself is created by adding tin to copper. And you create a very strong metal that way. So the most powerful societies in the world at that point in time were the societies who had access to tin and also to copper. You see, if you're going to outfit a military to fight, say, another army that's using only stone spears or what have you, bronze shields and bronze armor becomes your super weapon. You're almost unbeatable in that sense. So the Bronze Age societies dominated the entire world. But then as the Bronze Age collapsed, the Iron Age took over. The most powerful societies in the Iron Age were the ones who had access to iron mines, and they took over the world. After that came the Dark Ages, and the most powerful weapon in the world in the Dark Ages was ignorance and stupidity. Now, you may be thinking, how can that be? How could ignorance and stupidity be a super weapon? 
think about the biggest wars that were fought in the world at that point. There was like the Great Crusades, and then there was also Genghis Khan and the Mongol Horde. The Great Crusades was basically a whole bunch of Christian armies getting together to fight a bunch of Muslims in Jerusalem, or throughout the Middle East generally. The reason they did that is because the Pope told them if they would stop killing each other and go out and kill innocent people on the other side of the world, then God will forgive them of all their sins. And people actually did that. The biggest military campaign in Europe at that point was the Crusades. It was a war based on stupidity and ignorance, but it was the most powerful one there is. It can be a very, ignorance can be a very powerful motivating factor. But then the other big war of that era was Genghis Khan and his uh, atrocities through China, the Middle East, and into Europe. He literally flattened China and sent him back into the Stone Age. He almost did the same with the Middle East, and he almost did the same with big areas of Europe as well. He wasn't fighting for high and noble ideals, you know, like freedom of speech or democracy or anything. He was literally causing destruction because he could. Him, I mean, I, I suppose you could say that's the reason why the Mongols were the ultimate barbarians, because they destroyed everything that they came in front of. But after the Dark Ages came the Industrial Age. The most powerful superweapon or the superpowers in the Industrial Age were the countries who had industrial capabilities. If you look at the biggest wars in the Industrial Age, there was World War I and World War II. Now, the First World War, the outcome of that conflict wasn't decided on the battlefield. The Eastern Front and Western Front were almost fought to a stalemate. The reason Germany lost the First World War is because the Allies were able to produce more bullets and more uniforms and send more people into the field than the Germans could. We literally outproduced Germany in an industrial capacity, and that's why the First World War ended the way it did. The Second World War, that was also an industrial age war. And that one was fought and won in the factories around the world. You see, the two or three major battles in the Second World War, like the Siege of Stalingrad, the Battle of Kursk, and the Normandy landings, they all happened because the Russians and the British and the Americans could produce more planes and more bombs and more tanks than the Germans could. There were battles that led to a decisive outcome in that conflict, but it was the factories that won the war there. So that's the general makeup here. In this current age, the people who will be the most powerful will be the information age warriors. And I'll give you some specific examples on how information can lead to an outcome of war in just a second. But before I do that, just as a thought experiment, I want you guys to think about who's going to win the wars going on in the world right now between, let's say, Russia and Ukraine, for example. The way Ukraine is fighting the war is to get the Western powers, particularly the United States, to give them lots of arms and ammunition that they can throw on their Russian adversaries. They're fighting an information error war using industrial age capabilities. The Russians, on the other hand, they tried to fight this as an industrial age war in the first year and it didn't work. They tried it in the second year and it still didn't work. Now they're pivoting to fighting an information age war. Instead of fighting the Ukrainians head on, Putin is trying to fight the Europeans in Africa. As a result of that, he's toppling the loyalties of a lot of African countries, which were formerly French colonies. This is completely disrupting the Ukrainians' capability of getting support from Western powers. So if you want to make a prediction on the outcome of that war, if things continue as they are, in the information age, it's the information age war methodologies that will win. To give you an example, remember before we were comparing bronze armor to stone tools, you can't fight a bronze age war using stone tools. The outcome's only gonna go one way. Similarly, in the information age, you can't fight information age wars using industrial age methodologies. So this whole, uh, you know, in America they talk about the military industrial complex. 
that's great to have in the industrial age, the industrial complex, right? It's literally there in the name. But that whole thing has to collapse and destroy itself because it's completely redundant in the information age. Remember, it's information that will win wars in this era. And to give you guys an example of this, I want to show you guys two information age conflicts that have already happened in the world right now. I think that Gandhi is probably the perfect poster child for an information age warrior. You see, Gandhi was trying to get independence from the British since the end of the First World War. He was using non-violent, non-cooperation as his main weapon of war. Basically saying, we're not going to support the British Empire, which was the most important, most powerful empire in the world at the time, and he's going to be defeat them without firing a shot. But he didn't get anywhere. After the Second World War in the late uh, teens, 19 teens and to the 20s and 30s, he just wasn't getting anywhere at all. Then he decided in the 1940s was to, I mean, the big breakthrough he had at that point was to invite British and American journalists to view his non-cooperation and non-violent protests. And what those journalists did was they viewed and eyewitnessed uh, British soldiers cracking open the heads of Indians in non-violent protest. These reports were distributed back to the British people and to the American people and that in turn changed the whole outcome of the conflict. The British didn't want to be the colonizers who beat defenseless people who were non-violent and not threatening them. And in doing that, that's how Gandhi actually won the war, let's call it a war in inverted commas, against the British. He was able to defeat the British Empire by giving information to the British people and without firing a shot. So information is actually the ultimate super weapon. And I want to give you guys a second example here, which is the Arab Spring. A few years ago, once upon a time when Facebook was at some stage a force of good in the world, uh, there were a whole bunch of dictators around the Middle East. People got together using Facebook and information age technology, like social media is an information age technology. They coordinated their nonviolent protests against their dictators just about a decade or more ago. As a result of that, all a lot of the dictators in the Middle East and North Africa started to fall and topple. It was largely a nonviolent protest, and for the most part, those dictators did send out their secret police and their military to try and topple these nonviolent protesters. But they had information. They were able to coordinate with each other. They were able to get the public world's opinion on their side through simple information. So this is uh, another one of the big uh, aha moments I want you guys to have with this video series is that we are now in the information age and you can't use industrial age thinking to get ahead in the world anymore. The whole world has completely changed. It's actually going to become less violent in the years ahead. But as that uh, decrease in violence happens, the complete destruction of the industrial age will have to happen. So we've talked about you know, history so far, a little bit of philosophy. I want to get into spirituality right now and talk about that magic number four that I mentioned before. You see, there are four primary kinds of energy. And the simplest way to explain this in a way I suppose most people can understand is to correlate it to the four seasons of the year. You start with spring, which is where life is born. You get into summer, or spring transforms into summer, which is a period where life is at its zenith, where they're reproducing and everything's getting bigger and better. After that comes autumn, which you can loosely correlate to the decline of life, meaning you know, old age more or less, then comes winter, which you can loosely correlate with death. So just as every year goes through four cycles, there are four kinds of energy. I suppose the other way to explain this is that there are four periods within the day itself. There's sunrise, which loosely correlates to spring. There's midday, which correlates to summer. There's the evening, which correlates to winter, and then, I'm sorry, to autumn. Then there's nighttime or midnight, which correlates to winter. 
So it's a constant cycle where everything's always being refreshed. This is the general template for the idea behind the four yugas. That there's four eras of humanity on a macro scale that are always recycling and are always in a constant uh, state of regeneration. Now from a palmistry perspective, we look at this in terms of the four fingers on the hands. The primary finger or the index finger is ruled by the planet Jupiter. And Jupiter loosely is correlated to the energy of spring, where there's a new birth and new beginnings. Then comes the energy of the sun, which correlates to the energy of summer, where everything is at its height and strength, followed by autumn, which is the finger for Mercury, followed by Saturn, which is the finger for winter, if you will. They constantly replay itself. So after Saturn comes Jupiter, just as after winter comes spring and its rebirth. This also correlates loosely to the four Vedas and really every other system of mysticism that you can see. Now, let's have a look at the energy behind these last nine cycles or nine eras of time that we've gone through and have a look at the planets that ruled them. So the Paleolithic, the early Stone Age, I believe was ruled by the planet Jupiter. And what I mean by that is this is the area where humanity had its first big breakthrough. We started using stone tools. So for the first time in humanity's history, we had to develop the communication tools on how to communicate passing that knowledge down to the next generation. You see, most animals, all they can do is teach their children how to hunt or how to thrive. They can't teach their grandchildren or great-grandchildren or great-great-grandchildren because they don't actually have the language skills. They don't write anything down. They don't pass on stories that way. Human beings in the Paleolithic era started to do that. This is why Jupiter is so important here because Jupiter is the planet for teaching and education. This was one of the major breakthroughs in the Paleolithic because one smart teacher could instruct and influence the next 10 or 20 generations of his or her tribe. After that period came the Ice Age, the coldest period in humanity's history. That's actually the period where the sun started to rule the age and the era. Because of the difficulty of survival in that era, humanity started to bundle together into tribes and to groups. There's, the sun rules government, generally speaking, and the king as well. So once we started coming together in tribes, we started behaving and thinking more like sun-based people. After that period was the Mesolithic, which is the era of the hunter-gatherers. And that's the era for Mercury. You see, Mercury rules intelligence. It's the ability to think and uh, to solve complex problems. When you're in a hunting tribe or in a hunting group, you've got to plan and coordinate your attack on an animal or on a herd of animals with the utmost precision. There's no margin of error over there. That's why Mercury is so important. But also in the Mesolithic, people started using herbs as medicine as well. That takes a tremendous amount of intelligence to figure out, eat this herb, stay away from that mushroom, and so on. That's why the Mesolithic was ruled by the planet Mercury. Then came the Neolithic, the agricultural age. And I believe that was ruled by the planet Saturn. So the energy for Saturn is one of hard work, but it's something that gives you rewards, but after a delay or after a long period of time. In the hunter-gatherer societies of the Mesolithic, you could go out hunting today, and if you were lucky, you'd be able to come back with a, I don't know, a deer or a boar or something to feast on. In the Neolithic, you had to plant seeds today in order to reap a harvest six months later. It was delayed gratification, the ultimate delayed gratification, in fact. It took a lot of time and patience in order to protect your grains from other predators and other people. That's why the Neolithic or the agricultural age was ruled by Saturn. But what's interesting is after that period came the Bronze Age, which was one of the high periods of humanity. That's where we invented civilization. As I said, we invented writing, we invented all these other amazing things that we take for granted today. In fact, if you look at humanity, it's really taking two important leaps 
it would be from the Paleolithic Stone Age into the Bronze Age. Like a lot of historians just look at that as one single era. But the Bronze Age was really ruled by Jupiter, just like the Paleolithic Stone Age was ruled by Jupiter. We started teaching our children and descendants how to build great societies at that point. But then the Bronze Age collapsed and the Iron Age began. And that was also ruled by the planet Sun, just like the Ice Age. See, in the Ice Age, we started coming together in tribes, but in the Iron Age, we started coming together in terms of countries and city-states. If you read most of the mythologies out of the Iron Age, like Homer, the Iliad, and the Odyssey, and so on, even the Mahabharata, they'll talk about great kings and great dynasties. They don't talk about the great teachers so much from that era as they talk about the people who ruled over them. People had their loyalty to the state at that point. That was considered a good thing once upon a time. After the Iron Age came the Dark Ages, which is the era of Mercury. Just like the Mesolithic, we became hunter-gatherers uh, using our intelligence. In the Dark Ages, the era of ignorance, we were actually using an unprecedented amount of intelligence to try and get through our ignorance at that period of time. After that came the Industrial Age, which I believe is ruled by the planet Saturn. Industrial applications take a long, long time to develop, just as any inventions. You come up with the idea, you've got to find money to build the idea, and you've got to figure out how to sell it. So it's a delayed gratification, a lot like the agricultural age. But I also want you to have a look at what happened to humanity during the industrial age. We went from a period where we had individuality and individual freedoms to becoming more or less subservient to our jobs. The moment we were born, we were getting ready or prepared for a career. Then we'd live out our life in that career, for the majority of our life in healthy working hours actually. Then in old age, we'd just go into decline. We became cogs in a machine more or less. That's the dehumanizing aspect that Saturn puts people through. So the big takeaway here is, I want you to have a look at these eight ages I've just listed. We go from Jupiter to Sun to Mercury to Saturn, then back to Jupiter to Sun, Mercury and Saturn. And just as the last age, the industrial age is ruled by Saturn, that means therefore the next stage has to be ruled by Jupiter. And Jupiter is the great one. That's the period where humanity is at its zenith. So one thing I predict is over the next few centuries, humanity is actually going to be getting better and better and better. It's going to be our huge leap forward just as the Bronze Age and the Paleolithic Early Stone Age was. And I want to give you guys examples of what we can expect to see in the coming decades and centuries in just a second, but before I do that, I want to talk about the decline that happens at the end of each age. And that happens through the energy of Rahu, the north node of the moon. That's a planet for ignorance, and it destroys society at the end of every age. Uh, hang on. Okay, so let's talk about philosophy here and figure out how the Industrial Age actually collapsed. Remember I was saying in the last slide that Rahu causes the collapse of Dharma in each age. Dharma is, there's no word for it that has a direct translation in English, but it loosely translates into righteousness, or so doing what is right. And Rahu is a, more of a parasitic planet. Every energy, every concept or philosophy it gets close to, it mirrors it and then eventually sucks the life right out of it. That's why Rahu causes destruction. Now, the last time we had a collapse of Dharma, the last time there was a collapse of an age, was at the end of the Dark Ages, that led into the Industrial Age. And I want you guys to have a look at the philosophies behind each age. See, the Dark Ages started out as an era of ignorance, but actually it's not right to say that. It was the era of faith and spirituality. Prior to that time, in the Iron Age, people owed their loyalty to their kings and to their emperors or to their countries. Remember I was saying before it was ruled by the energy of the sun. At that point in time, people would go to war with other countries simply because their overlords or their rulers would tell them to do so. And it got so bad and so difficult in Europe 
that people just decided we're just not going to do this anymore and the religious order took over they decided rather than owe allegiance to a worldly king why not owe allegiance to a god instead and so their plan was actually to unite all of humanity or all of christendom at least under the one umbrella should be loyal to your lord in the sky as opposed to your landlord here on earth that was the general idea of like the iron age transitioning into the dark ages but it started out as an era based on faith which if you look at it from that angle it's probably a good thing because in theory it means you're fighting less but then rahu took over the dark ages and which led into the great crusades they, the religious orders actually started more wars in the latter part of the dark ages than the iron age kings ever could so the philosophy of faith got to a point where people just stopped believing you know whatever bronze age ideas they had they started listening to a guy wearing a funny hat sitting in rome if him and his friends told you that for example the sun rotated around the earth you'd believe that as opposed to your bronze age ancestors who'd believe that the earth rotated around the sun if those religious people told you that the earth is flat people started believing that too because their whole methodology was based on faith and at the end of the dark ages came the industrial age and its foundation was based on the philosophy of science see science is an evidence based philosophy you come up with a hypothesis you design an experiment you run the experiment you collect the data and then you draw conclusions it's a very simple methodology to finding out something factual and observable about the world. It is a fundamental philosophy. And if you have a philosophy based on fact and evidence, that tends to generally trump a faith-based philosophy. You see if you believe that the sun rotates around the earth because a guy wearing a funny hat told you to so, whereas someone else can observe the opposite effect happening through a telescope like Galileo or Copernicus then it's the evidence based people who carry the weight in the argument because they can prove what they're seeing and what they're observing and so the whole industrial age was built on the philosophy of science of going away from faith and going more towards an evidence based approach of the world one thing you're going to notice that's been happening over the last 10 or 20 years a lot of scientists have been getting into debates with faith-based institutions in america they went crazy a few years ago over creationism they wanted to teach creationism in science class but that's the wrong philosophy right that's in dark ages to industrial age uh, debate that should have happened 4 or 500 years ago it shouldn't be happening now Look at the way Rahu has destroyed science however. Rahu has mirrored the scientific method and created a new philosophy based around materialism. You see if all science can do is accept evidence that is based on observable fact, then the philosophy you derive out of that is one of materialism. And the materialist philosophy is basically on the assumption that the only thing that's real in the world is what the senses perceive. that the smartest person in the world who has is the one who has the most material goods the happiest person in the world is the best looking person and so on if you look at the world around us right now if my thesis is correct and that the industrial age is collapsing and the information age is taking over then we should be living in a materialistic society where rich people are considered smart and intelligent where good looking people are considered smart and intelligent and above everyone else. You see, this is how Rahu copies a society and destroys it. It takes something that works and creates it and turns it into a caricature. So, one thing about Rahu is it's a very sociopathic type of energy. It's very narcissistic. If you look at the world around you, what you'll notice is it's actually the sociopaths who rule the world around us. back during the early part of the industrial age there was actually a secret cold war that was going on between the sociopaths or the materialistic people versus the scientists in the early industrial age england was supposed to become an egalitarian society that was fueled by enlightenment based thinking 
based off of science. But instead it became the country that invaded pretty much every continent on earth and committed terrible atrocities and genocide everywhere they went. And it wasn't the egalitarian thinkers who did this, it was the sociopaths, they took over. And if you really think about it, today we live in a sociopath's dream. All social systems around the world right now are a caricature of what they're supposed to be. They're no longer their original institutions. And the people who are most successful in the world right now are the sociopaths. So have a think about this. The schools and the education system, they no longer teach children anymore. There used to be a time where schools would teach kids how to think and how to process information. But then somehow the sociopaths took over and they started teaching creationism and started treating uh, dogma in the classes. The kids who go through schools today aren't the kids who can think for themselves. They're the kids who know how to pass a test. The sociopaths are the most successful people through the education system because they're so empty and broken inside, they can work relentlessly on their school grades and get through that system. They're the most successful ones. And if you look at the most successful, say, teachers or uh, education-based bureaucrats, they're the sociopaths as well. You, know, you look at your day job, work, you'll notice, doesn't actually have meaning anymore. There was once upon a time that people would go to work and that would be their dharam. That would be their, what they would contribute to the world. But we don't have that anymore. We've lost our humanity during the industrial age. You're, you've more or less become a replaceable cog in a bigger corporate machine. Let's say you're an accountant and your boss thinks you're not doing your job well. They can fire you and replace you with another person with the same skill set. They're not looking at your humanity in comparison to another person's humanity. They're looking at your skill set. That's the sort of world that sociopaths thrive in. If you look at the healthcare system, you'll notice that it doesn't actually heal anyone of disease. Now, the, the incorrect way to phrase it is Western medicine, as they call it. Western medicine, once upon a time, used to be a great thing, but now it's become a caricature of what it's supposed to be. If you get sick, the sociopaths in charge of healthcare, they won't try to heal you or fix whatever your ailment is. They will sell you a tablet or a prescription for something that will suppress your symptoms long enough that they can get the next cell or the next prescription out of you. In fact, if a sociopath were to define or build or decide a healthcare system, they build one in which they keep you alive long enough to extract every cent or every dollar out of you. That's the modern healthcare system. If you look at our political leaders, they don't actually lead anyone anymore. What they do is they uh, turn one aspect of society against the other aspect. Then they stand and rule over both. If a sociopath were to have defined and built a leadership system, this is the one that they would have built. This is what we live under. Now, the media, or the mainstream media, doesn't inform people anymore. Just as the education system doesn't teach people anymore, the media system, all it does is brainwash people. It doesn't give them the, the fundamental information they need to understand the world. The legal system doesn't give justice anymore either. It's actually the sociopaths who are the most successful going through the legal system. They know how to bend the law, they know how to manipulate the truth in order to get their way. So the, this is the, really the big takeaway here. Sociopaths or Rahu-based people succeed in today's society. That's, uh, that's the other big takeaway I want you guys to have. I don't want you guys to become sociopaths or even think like them, even though they're successful. They're actually going to be destroyed because the society that they've built is based on late industrial age thinking. And all of this has to collapse and it's going to be replaced by something else. So the other big takeaway here, as I said a few slides ago, Jupiter is actually going to rule the information age. And the last time this happened was during the Bronze Age. That's when the greatest feats of humanity were achieved. You know, we built the pyramids, which is something we still can't replicate today with all of modern technology. 
If we gave the best architects in the world unlimited access to technology, unlimited funding and unlimited time, we still couldn't build the pyramids of Giza today. You know, the Bronze Age is when the Vedas were composed and we don't have any uh, system even close to that today. It's the era where mathematics was invented along with astronomy and astrology. And I believe this is actually going to repeat again. In fact, if you look at the advances of humanity over the last, say, 60 to 80 years, you'll see that we've recently put a man on the moon, which is a huge, huge accomplishment, just in terms of humanity, taking one of our species off our Earth. We've also invented the internet, and we've created artificial intelligence as well. These three things alone, happening literally within the last you know, 80 odd years, is a huge step forward here. Humanity hasn't done anything similar to this since the last Bronze Age. This is why I think Jupiter is already taking over the world right now, in a good way. You see, Jupiter is a teacher, and it succeeds by instructing others. So the most successful societies in this coming age will be those that can learn and process information the quickest and the most efficiently. See, in the industrial age, Saturn-based thinking was the path to success. In order to be a successful person, say a century ago, you'd have to go to school or through the school system, then you'd go to college and then you'd get a job and you'd work in that job for 30 odd years or 40 odd years, however long it was, and then you'd have enough money to know what to do in your retirement. It was the long-term approach. But this doesn't work in the information age because Rahu has already destroyed society. So the future, despite all this bleakness about sociopaths ruling the world, the future is actually really, really, really good. And I want you to, I mean, to prove that, I want you to have a look at the conflict of ideas in each age. The industrial age versus the information age. Now, the industrial age was supposed to be all about science, but then it descended into the philosophy of materialism. So the modern intellectual war is between materialism versus information, or Rahu versus Jupiter. The other way to put it is if materialism is greed and information is knowledge, it's really a conflict between greed versus knowledge. And knowledge always wins. In fact, in Jyotish, one thing we say is that Jupiter is the only planet that can control Rahu. This means Rahu and the sociopathic elements of society that it's created uh, have to be destroyed by the wisdom and instruction of Jupiter. And this rebirth of society is actually a good thing. So if you look at all this destruction and recreation taking place around us right now, all the industrial age Saturn based industries are being destroyed and Jupiter based replacements are taking their place. The, uh, look at the internet, for example, as the ultimate technology, and you'll see how it's already democratizing knowledge. As a result of that, universities are becoming redundant now. Once upon a time, the only way to get an advanced education was to go to a university. The reason for that is because universities had the biggest libraries in your city or in your country at that point in time. Right now, everyone has access to every book ever written on their smartphone. It's literally in their pocket for most of the day. In the industrial age, people would go to school and it's more or less like a, a conveyor belt. You know, the ultimate image I've got to explain this is from that Pink Floyd song, Another Brick on the Wall. You know how there were kids on a conveyor belt and they'd go into a meat grinder and then eventually turn into mince meat or sausages? That's basically what was happening to kids throughout the industrial age. You'd be born and then you'd get onto the first level of the conveyor belt, which is primary school. If you graduated from there, you'd go into the next layer of the conveyor belt, which was high school, where you'd be given more upgrades and more knowledge. If you dropped out of school or ended high school, you'd get straight into the workforce. If by chance you went to university, you'd get the next level of upgrades and then you'd get into the workforce. But you're literally on a conveyor belt as far as your education system goes. It's like uh, Henry Ford building a car from step one, step two, step three. That's what the education system was like then. 
But because of the internet, universities are all redundant now. You don't need to go to university to learn anything because all that information is online already. All you have to do is put in the hours to learn what you need to learn and then apply those skills. The other big uh, advance that's happened is smartphones have now democratized communication. Used to be a time where if you wanted to communicate with someone on the other side of the world, you'd write them a letter and then be dependent on your government or your postal service to deliver it. You don't have to do that anymore. You can directly talk to someone on the other side of the world. Social media has now democratized all opinions. And now news outlets are becoming redundant. Again, there used to be a time where if you wanted to know what was happening on the other side of the world, you were dependent on the opinion of a news outlet. What they'd show you, what they'd tell you about what's happening is what you'd believe. But that's no longer the case. Social media is destroying the news outlets. And if you look at the blockchain, that's starting to democratize finance. And very soon, banks will start to become redundant. And AI is democratizing workflow. So soon your boss will be redundant and maybe you too as well. So what you're going to notice is that new tech is going to destroy all other narcissistic industries around the world in the future, such as healthcare, politics, and the legal system. You know, we were saying a minute ago that if a sociopath were to decide or define a healthcare system, they'd create the one we've got right now. The most successful doctors and medical professors and pharmaceutical people in the world are actually sociopaths. Just as the most successful politicians are all sociopaths, the most successful lawyers and judges, they're all sociopaths too. They're all going to be destroyed in the years to come. And the fundamental reason for all of this change is the adoption and invention of the internet. Remember, the information age is going to destroy everything from the industrial age. So if you look at the world from this context, you'll see that the world is actually getting better. It's getting a lot better. But we can't notice all of this because there's a lot of destruction going on around us. There's a big fire, and then as that fire destroys a whole village, metaphorically speaking, a bigger city takes place right on top of it. Similarly, old systems of thinking and late industrial age thinking is being destroyed. This destruction is painful and bloody. It, we feel it the most because it's happening right in front of us right now. But what I want you guys to have a look at is the big picture. Because you see, in the wake of this destruction, something amazing is being built. Now, I've talked a lot about the good being built and the rebirth that's taking place. Let me finish talking about the destruction that's taking place. Because that won't go on forever and ever. Eventually, the industrial age has to end. And I believe it's going to happen in our lifetime. But after that, that's when the world is in a much, much better space. So what I'm basically saying is over the next few years and decades, there's going to be a lot more chaos in the world around us. During this time, your politicians will try to manipulate you. So don't be manipulated by them. The big picture or the big next big insight I suppose I want you guys to have here is that the sociopaths won't rule the future. The future will be run by Jupiterians or teachers. Meaning if you're a philosopher or if you're a thinker or a spiritual person, you'll be one of the most successful people in the years to come. So let's talk about this great destruction. I believe it's going to start in the year 2026, not only two and a half years from now. And let me sort of caption what I mean by this. It's going to be the start of the end of Western civilization. And I say that as more or less a throwaway line, because Western civilization is actually a Greek idea. If you think of all the great things about the West, like democracy, freedom of speech, equality agendas, all these things, they have their antecedents in ancient Greece. A lot of people will tell you that it was the Americans who invented Western civilization, or it's the British, or maybe even the Romans, but it's actually the Greeks. They laid the foundation of everything. So when I say 
Western civilization is ending or will begin its end in 2026, I don't mean the Greek foundation of that. That's already been destroyed. What I'm saying is going to be destroyed is the industrial age. And that is actually an English idea. So it's actually the beginning of the end of the materialist philosophy that we talked about before. Between now and then, there'll be a lot of inflation and deflation taking place in an economic sense. And in the next video that I make in this series, we'll be talking a lot about how to navigate the financial upheaval that's going to be taking place. But one prediction I want to give you guys in this video is that I think there's going to be a terrible financial crash that will take place in the latter months of 2026. It'll go on for uh, possibly a few years after then. At this point, there's also going to be a major war, I believe, in Southeast Asia. That's going to happen in the aftermath of that financial crisis. So the 2026 is basically the point where Western slash industrial age slash materialistic societies enter the point of no return. Once they hit that point in that financial crisis, they won't be able to rebuild and it's just a terminal decline from that point on. So we're more or less looking at an intellectual end to industrialized civilization, not a literal apocalypse of Western civilization. In the years ahead, you'll have media trying to manipulate you into thinking that the West is collapsing. That's not the case. The West is going to do just fine. And hopefully these ideas, these Greek ideas of democracy and freedom of speech and all that great stuff, that is actually going to continue and flourish in the years to come. But that's one difficult period to have a look at, late 2026. The other one is over a five-year horizon from 2038 to 2043. And this I call the period of the final war. That's an ominous thing to say, right? But this is actually the death of the old age. So if 2026 is a period where it hits a point of no return and it cannot recover after then, then 2038 to 2043 is a period where it meets its ultimate end. At this point in history, like a decade or more from now, the majority of the world will be those um, actually, I'll rephrase that. The majority of the industrial age people at that point in time would have left the world by then. The majority of the leaders at that point in time would have been those who were born towards the end of the industrial age. So think of like Gen X or Gen Y people. They're the generation who were born in the transition between the industrial age and the information age. Those are going to be the guys in power during that era. Now, the reason I think that's going to be an era of conflict is because the information age people will be the majority on the earth at that point. So if you look at the population of one age declining as the next age takes over, eventually it's going to reach a point where the balance of power shifts all towards information age people. And I think this is going to result in a huge war between the worst or the most sociopathic people in the industrial age versus the bravest people in the information age. It's going to be nasty, that period. Your duty as a human being is to support the next generation of people, the information age thinkers, and to get out of their way. You should not be supporting the sociopathic industrial age people in that conflict. If there's one duty you have to society, it's to make sure you're getting out of the way of the good guys then. So 2038 is when there'll be this large scale war. We could summarize it energetically as Rahu versus Jupiter, the sociopaths versus the information age people. And by roughly 2043, that conflict should hit its peak. Now, the last point I've got on this slide is I'm expecting one billion people to leave the planet at that point. Now, I know I said it earlier in this video, I'm not going to make any apocalyptic claims or terrible claims in this video, but I do want to mention that one right there. It may sound like it's a terrible death toll, it's so unrealistic, it can never happen, but have a think about all the ages of society that have already happened and the percentage of people who died in each age. 
You know, for example, when the Dark Ages ended and the Industrial Age started, the last period of the decline of Dharma, there were two major uh, activities or actions that killed a lot of people. There was the Black Death or the Plague, and then there was Genghis Khan and his genocides. Now, the Black Death killed somewhere between a quarter to 33% of the people in the world. And Genghis Khan and his Mongol horde, they killed about 40 million people in the world. At that point in time, that was close to 10 to 15% of the world. So if you think about it, between the Black Death and Genghis Khan, which historically only happened about 200 years apart from each other, they killed nearly 40% of the world's population. That was in the last era of decline. I believe we're in a new era of decline, which means, you know, if history were to repeat itself, about 40% of the people in the world should be leaving the planet. So as of recording this video, the population of the Earth is about 8 billion. So you can do the maths on how much that destruction should be happening. So I'm not going to say it's like three or four billion people leave the planet. I think one billion is a conservative estimate here. But I don't want to dwell on that number too much. I want to get you guys to the point of safety so that you're not caught up in that number. So the question then is what to do about this. And this isn't a question I can answer in this video because this one's gone on so long. I'll create another video where I help to navigate your family through all this mess. And I want to translate, you know, just to give you like a little teaser of what that video is about, I want to translate those four kinds of energy that we talked about before into the four kinds of wealth. How best to support your health, your family, your wealth in a financial sense, and also your spirit. So we'll come back and talk about that in the next video. But if you do have any questions on this one, and I'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions, put them in the comment section below. Thanks a lot, guys.